welcome. My name is Julian Schlossberg, and the name of our show is Movie Talk. And each week, we'll be talking to some of the men and women who work in motion pictures, theater, and television. 25 years ago, I had the privilege to meet, work with, and become friends with my next guest. She's an actress. She's a singer. She's an activist. She's a fashion designer, a podcast host, and became one of the first international supermodels in the world. In England, she's known in some circles as Dame <laughs> Leslie Lawson. But in America, she's known as Twiggy. And Oscar Hammerstein wrote it best, Twigs. He said, there is nothing like a Dame. So, <laughs> well, thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, you've been asked some of these questions before. That's all right. I still have to get to the answers if I can. <laughs> Let's start out with how did you get the name Twiggy? Well, I was always a skinny kid, always. I mean, I ate and ate and ate, but nothing happened. It, it, my mum used to say it goes down to your big toe and it, you've got a big, big toe. That's where your food goes. Because <laughs> I was this funny little skinny kid and I had very skinny legs. And so when I was a teenager, I had a Saturday job in a hairdresser's. You know, I was a schoolgirl. I had a Saturday job uh, when I was about 14. My sister was a hairdresser and she got me a little job, you know, washing hair and sweeping up the hair that was cut. And one of the boy barbers used to tease me because I was so skinny. And he used to call me Sticks at first, which was a bit unfortunate. And then it kind of turned into Twiggy. A year and a half later, when the whole thing happened to me, the whole discovery thing, you know, that was my nickname by then. People used to call me affectionately Twiggy. And so when I did my first interview in February 1966 for a big daily newspaper, the headline was Twiggy, the face of 66. And that was it. <laughs> my life was never the same. That's for sure. You know, all of us go through the teenage years. And we know we're not an adult, and we know we're not a child any longer. But we do that in private or with a few friends. You explode on the <laughs> world stage. It's so overwhelming just to think about it. How was it to live? I grew up in a happy home, I'm happy to say. I had a lovely mum and dad, two big sisters. So I was the baby. So I was very spoiled, nicely spoiled, I hope. And I loved school and I loved my home life, but it was a very small little suburban family. So what happened to me wasn't even in my mindset. You know, it was like that didn't happen to girls. you got to remember in that period, certainly models mainly came from middle class and upper class families. I mean, working class girls didn't become models. So, I mean, it wasn't even something that I was thinking I was going to do. I loved them. I had pictures of Jean Shrimpton on my wall and Verushka. I mean, all the models of the day. But that was like the dream world. You know what I mean? I was going to study. I wanted to do um, fashion design, ironically, and, and try and get into a good uh, fashion art school. And that's what I planned to do. But fate had another idea for me. But fate let you become a fashion designer yeah. <laughs> as well. Somebody up there heard my dreams. But, you know, I, I thought they'd all gone mad when it happened to me. I thought, you know, this is silly. I'm this funny little thing. If I'd have gone to a model agency then, they wouldn't have taken me. You had to be five foot eight and I'm five foot six. And you had to have minimum measurements, which I was smaller than. I didn't think at the time, but now I look back on it. I, w I was going to be the new look because the models before me didn't look like, you know, they looked, they were very tall, gorgeous, elegant women. Jean Shrimpton was like the crossover because she, she looked much younger. She was much more natural. She was like four years before me. She was early 60s, incredibly beautiful, very tall. I always thought she looked like a young, beautiful stallion. She was so beautiful. And then I came along and the, the whole look changed. You know, I was this kind of gammon, androgynous looking, short hair, skinny legs, mini skirt. So that I was the new look, but I didn't know it. <laughs> and two of the most beautiful eyes 
ever put oh. into anyone's head. Well, thank they you. were gorgeous and still <laughs> are. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, I guess the idea that you had working class folks, your dad was a master carpenter and mm-hmm. your mom worked in a factory and you had a happy home. There was the stability to be able to withstand what had to be seemingly to me just an overwhelming experience as a kid to go there. By 17 years old, you're on the cover of Vogue in America. I know. What was even more bonkers, I mean, that was amazing. You know, usually models kind of work up doing small jobs, and if they're lucky, they get to work with the big guys. You know, within a year, I was working with Richard Avedon, who to me was the greatest fashion photographer of that century, really. Yeah, and you also were photographed by Cecil Beaton, who I mean, was at the top of his game. I know, I was 17 years old, Bert Stern. Bert Stern did the documentary on, on my trip to America, you know. And um, the scariest thing was that was all amazing, and I just thought it was bonkers, really. But it was it was fun. Listen, I didn't have to go to school. I was wearing all these gorgeous clothes. I was getting paid money. It was lovely. <laughs> but... I did get almost squashed in New York, you know, because a crowd gathered one day when we were, I was working with a wonderful photographer called Melvin Sikorsky, who's brilliant, another brilliant photographer for, um, we were doing a big advertising campaign and word got out that we were filming and, you know, doing photographs and a crowd gathered and a crowd, because when I came into New York, I was on the news and, you know, it was, it went mad. It was because I came in after the Beatles. I was part of the British invasion. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, what was the toughest part of being a supermodel for you? When I first arrived in New York, you know, I, when I landed, I came in to work for American Vogue to work with Richard Avedon. Anyway, we landed there and, and, and there was a press conference that I didn't expect. And then we came out and there were all these girls and banners, you know, because I followed the Beatles in, it became this kind of British invasion thing. And then I was on various chat shows. So what happened suddenly, instead of coming in and being a Vogue model, I came in and I was turned into this overnight kind of celebrity person. So when we started going for walks in New York, because I wanted to go shopping, of course, and New York's a great place to shop, I, you know, I got mobbed and, I, and it got scary. And that was quite hard to deal with. And we did one one day we were shooting, Melvin Sikorsky was doing this shoot for this huge uh, fabric campaign. And he wanted me coming out of a department store carrying bags. And he said, just walk to the car and I'll get 12 shots. He said, because I was inside and he said, there's a crowd gathering. He said, they're not out of control, but they can see the cameras. And Bert Stern was shooting a documentary on my trip. So there were a lot of cameras. So people see cameras and, you know, oh, what's going on? And they and it grew and it grew. And we came down, and it's all on, on the film, actually, that Bert took. And you can see me getting nervous because inside the store, the crowd was gathering around. You know, and I was a tiny little thing. And and we <laughs> we got to the circular doors to go out, and there were two policemen there. And I started to go through and I heard one say to the other one, we're not going to hold them back, Joel, or something like that. And I just screamed. I think I screamed mum. I screamed for my mum. <laughs> and I turn round to try and get someone. And per- the, the bodyguard they'd got me lost my hand. The other bodyguard just picked me up. We couldn't go back because – the camera got knocked out of the cameraman's hand. So the last shot of me is me kind of going, ah. And I got yeah. pushed through the door. This amazing man, Harold Paul, who was an ex-Mr. Universe, and his his arm was the same measurement as my waist. We measured it. <laughs> <laughs> and he picked me up under his arm like a bundle. And there was this narrowing alleyway to the limo, and the people were pushing. I'm like, oh, no, I want to order. We want to. I mean, they didn't want to hurt me, but crowds get out of control and he ran me through the crowd and I was hysterical and he put me through the limo window (laughs) and I remember laying on the limo floor and all my eyelashes came off and and it was really scary and I just wanted to go home. (laughs) It just sounds however 
that this was a good time that you were a smaller woman, not a bigger yeah. woman, because I don't exactly. think he could have uh, delivered you airborne without that, you know. Well, God bless Harold. He, he saved me. I could have got squashed. Yes. Tell me about, <laughs> did you meet and spend any time with Diana Vreeland, who ran Vogue at that time? Yes. She has a lot to do with changing my career, really. You know, I was very, very famous in England for that first year. And that's how she heard about me. And she, you got to remember in those days, she was like the doyen of fashion around the world. She was the queen. She read about me and she booked me to come to New York. I always say that Diana Vreeland turned me global, really, because <laughs> she put me on American <laughs> Vogue. Because she had the power then. If if she liked a model or a designer or a photographer and she said, that's the person, you know, that was it. If she's the girl, he's the designer, yeah, that was it. Was she maternal at all, any way, do you remember? Do you remember what she looked like? Yes, I do. She frightened me to death. You know, I was this kid. I was just 17. And I walked into, and Vogue is quite imposing. And, you know, Vogue is Vogue. It's, I mean, it's wonderful, but I was so intimidated. And I went into her office and she stood up. She was very tall and slim. She always wore black. She had a very strong face with a kind of quite a big nose. And her hair was jet black and slick back. She had red lips and a cigarette in a, in a holder. I was dumbstruck, and that doesn't happen to me very often, as you know. <laughs> but I have to say, she was so lovely to me. She became like a mum figure, she, which she wasn't like that. She obviously saw that I was scared. She was amazing to me, and we did become good friends for that period. I want to know, when did you meet Ken Russell, the director? Quite early. I mean, we shot The Boyfriend, which you're probably leading up to, the fir my first film, in, I think, 1969, because it came out in 70, 71. So I met him about 1968. I, I wasn't planning to act or be in a film, but he asked to see me. And at the time, he was the biggest British film director. You know, he, he'd he done Women in Love and, and The Devils. Well, he was shooting The Devils when I met him. And he was huge in England. And so I, I got a call, would I go and meet him? He was He was planning to do a film where he needed a very, very young girl. It was based on a William Faulkner novel. It was about an old kind of magician who traveled the world with this young ethereal girl. So he needed somebody very young. I was thrilled to meet him because I was a huge fan. Before he became a, a feature film director, he'd done amazing things on British television, on all the composers, and uh, they were amazing. He, was, he won so many awards. He was brilliant. And he did eventually did a film on Mahler, and he did Listomania. So he had a great interest in that. Oh, huge interest. And that's what all the TV, they, they were in, uh, under an umbrella called Omnibus and they were all the composers, Elgar, you know, Marla, he did uh, endless ones. Uh, so I met him about this other film that never happened because, they, I don't know, they couldn't get the finance, who knows. But by meeting him, I then met his then wife, Shirley, and we kind of got on really well. It became a friendship for a good year. Shirley Russell was one of the great costume designers Absolutely. in motion pictures. She was nominated for Academy Awards, including Reds, the Warren Beatty film. She was a terrific costume designer, yes. And one of, one of the most wonderful ladies. I loved her. So she, I mean, she, she became almost like a mum to me because she was that much older than me. You know, I was 16. So we became friends. I'd gone to see a new production of The Boyfriend, the stage play by Sandy Wilston, which is a pastiche on the 1920s. I mean, it's a very camp, silly little story. It's got great songs. I'd never seen anything like that. It was amazing. We were having dinner with Ken the next night. I was just saying, oh, my God, I've just seen this musical. It was amazing. And Ken loved his champagne. And, and so he was a bit tiddled. And he said, I've got a great idea. I'll, we'll make the film of The Boyfriend and you can play Polly Brown. And I just laughed. You know, I thought, oh, he's, he's had too much champagne. Anyway, he rang me the next day and said, um, what do you think? And I said, oh, gosh, really? 
And and I knew he had the power to, you know, he was this huge film director. I said, but I've never done a film, Ken. I've never sung and danced. Yeah, I've never done it. And he said, you can do it. You're going to go off to dance class and singing lessons. I don't want you to take acting lessons, but you're going to go singing lessons. And he said, I've got a year to finish The Devils, and then we're going to make The Boyfriend. And I went, oh, okay. <laughs> And that's how it happened. What a change for Ken Russell. I, <laughs> I mean, here's a guy who makes the heaviest of drama and the devils. I mean, when it finally came out, I played it in New York. I mean, that was one tough movie. I've never seen the whole of the devils, actually. I'm in it for about 30 seconds, you know, dressed as a, a little boy courtier. But I didn't take my clothes off. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of people did, but I didn't. <laughs> No, 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 you didn't. <laughs> well, uh, so let's talk about The Boyfriend. Let's talk about the fact, A, you won not one, but two Golden Globe Awards on your first movie. Come on. My head is spinning. I just can't get up with it. And let's talk also about what is it like your first day on the set of The Boyfriend. Try to go back in your memory and tell me. Oh, I remember it clearly. I, I was... I was scared. What's interesting, because I'd been modeling for, you know, three years or whatever, I wasn't, the, the, the camera didn't intimidate me. I was very used to cameras and, you know, I'd been through paparazzi cameras and as well as fashion cameras. So that, that was not my, my fear was the talking and the, you know, and the performing because I didn't know if I could do it. But, but I always say to people, you know, if you've got somebody like Ken Russell who believes in you, and put his career on the line by casting. You know, he had a huge fight with the film studios. They didn't want me, understandably. And he would not make the film without me, bless his heart. And he fought for me for nine months and he won in the end. You know, I thought, well, I've got, you know, I've really got to do it for Ken because he put that faith in me. Obviously, he saw something that I certainly didn't know I could do, but he saw something that I don't know. I never really asked him, but but that first day on the set was so scary. But I have to say, the whole cast was so lovely to me. You know, they were like they all looked after me, and there was one actor who wasn't nice, but I will not name them. But everyone else was absolutely brilliant, and I got Tommy Tune cast in in the Boyfriend. You know, he plays oh. the American. At that time, Ken he wouldn't fly. He had a fear of flying, so he wouldn't. He wanted to cut, you know, there's always an American character in that who sings and, and dances. And one of the boys, I think there's like four boys, and he didn't want an, an Englishman playing an American. He wanted an American singer-dancer. singer, singer dancer. And I'd just come back from New York when he was casting, and I'd seen Tommy on TV. The first time I saw him, it was like, oh, my, who is this creature? You know, this is six <laughs> foot six with these amazing legs and this beautiful face. And he had, at that time, he had very long, dark hair and tapping like, you know, well, you know how he dances. Like, yeah. And I said, oh, my God. And I waited till the end credits, not knowing Ken was looking for anyone. I didn't know till I got back. Um I waited for the end credits just to see who he was because he was so extraordinary. I'd never seen anything like it. And I got back and Ken said, you know, how am I going to find, you know, there's nobody in England. I've gone through all the Americans. They, they either can sing or they can dance, but they can't do it. I said, oh, my God, I've seen this guy. You will love him because Ken loved people who were at kind of extraordinary. So I knew he'd love Tommy. And so he found out, I don't know how, but I think, Tommy was living in California then, and he always told me afterwards that the phone rang one day and it was, hello, my name's Ken Russell and I, I want to talk to you about coming to – and he thought, it, he thought it was a friend winding him up. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's rather interesting. In today's world, you would be considered the co-producer of this <laughs> film. You <laughs> Number one, you found the property. Number two, you found the co-star. I mean, that's enough. To, I don't think Ken gave you the credit for that one, though. No, he didn't. <laughs> but it was a, it was the most wonderful experience of my uh, my then professional career, and it was that. It was like for me walking into the secret garden. It was like, oh 
my goodness. You know, I didn't know I could do it, number one. I was very frightened, but I worked really hard. I went to tap class for, you know, nine months and I took sing- I could always sing in tune. I mean, I sang at school. So it's just getting your confidence, really. And once we were in the, the swing of it, I just loved it. And I thought, oh, my, this is what I want to do. You know, I, you know, I'm not going to go back to model. I'm going to do this. I love it. I love it. And because of the film coming out, I got offered a recording deal. I got offered my own TV series in England, which was a var- in those days, you know, they did variety series like they used to in America. Do you remember the Sonny oh, and yes. Cher show? And the- Ed Sullivan show and Carol Burnett. Yeah, they were variety shows. And it was lovely. And I did two years of that where I had guests on and we'd sing and dance. It was fabulous. I loved it. Well, before you leave the modeling area, you leave around 20 years old. Are you in any way apprehensive about leaving or you can't wait to get it behind you? No, I love modeling and I never planned to do anything else. You know, I was so young. I could have modeled. Well, look at Kate. Kate Moss is still modeling and she just turned 50 last week. And funnily enough, I went back to modeling in my 50s, <laughs> <laughs> you know, along with everything else. But uh, no, I made it after the boyfriend because I got off the recording deal and I got off of the TV series. Number one, I didn't really have time to do both. And number two, there was a kind of perception in those days. I, I don't think it exists anymore. But in those days, it was like all models are kind of thick and stupid they're like coat hangers, they put clothes on. And they didn't really take you seriously as a performer if you were modeling as well. Do you know what I mean? It was like a, a weird, which is absolute rubbish, you know. I mean, how many, look at all the models who became huge film stars in America. And we would start with Audrey Hepburn or something, you know. I mean, Absolutely, I know. I think that perception's gone away now because so many girls. Oh, it has. Yeah. It has. It was the same thing years ago that if you uh, were on stage, you couldn't do movies because that was second class. Exactly. These kind of things come and go in society, and uh, I'm happy to see them go. (laughs) Oh, me too, because, you know, it's all performing in a way, you know. And actually the modeling actually helped me, you know, go into the other area of of working on camera. The the big fear for me was going on stage because I was fine with cameras. They didn't phase me at all. But the thought of going out in front of a live audience was like, oh, my God. (laughs) Well, let's go back to Ken Russell asking you to take singing and dancing lessons. Number one, what were the singing lessons like? Did you enjoy them? Were they tough for you? Oh, yeah. I loved it. I, I mean, I think learning anything is wonderful. As I say, I was lucky. I, I could sing in tune. I mean, I, I did have a voice. I just never used it apart from, you know, in the choir at school like you do when you're a kid. Yes. And I loved that era of music. That, you know, although uh, um, when I think Sandy Wilson wrote The Boyfriend in the 50s, but it was a pastiche on the 20s and 30s. So it was all that kind of period of music. And Ken... He had this incredible library. He was a collector of period films and period music. So every Friday night, Shirley would make kind of a big bowl of spaghetti and we'd all, they'd have friends over and they'd hang a sheet in the house and and project (laughs) these films. He showed me all the Fred and Ginger movies, all the Busby Barkley movies, and then all the kind of wonderful films from Europe, like Mamoulian and... Eisenstein and I mean he was like going to a, this wonderful college he became my mentor and my teacher he was a him and Shirley really they were extraordinary do you remember any specific direction that Ken Russell gave you on the boyfriend do you remember where I'm sure he aided you throughout but was there any time that you say oh boy I better change. He's right. I better go this way instead of that way. No, I really, really listened to him all the time. He'd usually let me, he'd just let me go. He'd just say, follow your instinct, do how you think it is. Because I think what he liked, as far as I can tell from watching the film, was the kind of, there's a kind of innocence and a naivety, isn't there? I mean, it's not like a great acting role. There's a naturalness to it. You know, I learned it, obviously. I. 
I learned my lines. I was very good. <laughs> I'm sure you came in well prepared. Yeah, no, I did. And as I say, all the other actors were so lovely to me and looked after me. And, you know, it was a very, very happy experience. And again, again it changed my life. Now, let's talk in terms of singing lessons. You came in having sung in the choir, et cetera. How about dance, dancing? I don't think you were known. Oh, my God. Well, that was, I know, I'd never danced in my life. <laughs> except on my dad's toes when he used to dance me around the room. <laughs> so, no, that was harder because singing, it was kind of a natural progression. I just learned about breathing and projecting. And, and also, you know, we, record, we, we did it in a studio. It wasn't live. You know, you record the tracks. and We should let the listener know that in musicals, they're pre-recorded when the actor – performs their mouthing or they may be singing along but it's all been recorded ahead of time as you know you know much better than me about films but in the in the 40s and 50s they often used to dub big stars with other singers didn't they they certainly did and look right down to my fair lady audrey's not singing i know she's not but she got the last laugh because she sang moon river That's right. in breakfast at tiffany's which is one of the great tracks ever. I love her singing that. It touches your heart. Breaks me up every time. Because, you know, singing is not just about hitting <laughs> beautiful notes. It's about singing from their heart. And that Audrey Hepburn track of her singing, is just it just breaks your heart, doesn't it? And the other one is um, Glynis John singing Sending the Clowns. And she wasn't a singer. And she doesn't. She kind of talks, sings it, and again, it's heart-wrenching. It's true. Look how what Rex Harrison did as Professor Henry Higgins. I mean... I'd, re I'd rest my case, Julian. <laughs> <laughs> then we'll move on immediately. <laughs> but the tap, that was hard work. Well, he sent me to a few ballet lessons, which was a killer, because I, you know, I'd never done any... It was just to kind of loose me up. And my teacher said I was the noisiest pupil she'd ever had in her room because <laughs> I just moaned. Uh, but then I got into the, my tap lessons, which I took to like a duck to water, actually. I loved it. I mean, I, I never got to Tommy's standard, but I got enough that I could, you know, do what I did in The Boyfriend. But Tommy never got to your standard in modeling. <laughs> He might, he might disagree. <laughs> <laughs> he might. He might indeed. <laughs> well, you know, since we're on musicals and you started to say this kind of music really attracted you, the 20s, the 30s, even the 40s, when you look at your career, let's go to my one and only on Broadway. You're nominated for a Tony. Can you imagine? You? I mean, I know, I'm so hand. impressed with your resume. <laughs> I'm impressed with your resume. I would have been more respectful when we did, <laughs> if love were only, if I had only known. Anyhow, how did my one and only come to you? And, and Well, as I told you, I you know, Tommy got cast in The Boyfriend via me. We became, you know, best, 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 best friends and, you know, still are. I love him to bits. And um, after The Boyfriend, we had this idea trying to get, another movie going and doing like a Fred and Ginger kind of thing. Tommy stayed in London and, and, and I carried on training under him. We used to meet three times a week and he was a tough teacher. He got me to another level. Again, not his level. You know, he's been tapping since he was five. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't get the money right. You know, it's very hard. Even though we'd come off a hit film, it was we it just fell apart. He then went back to America. This was would be like 73, 74. And then he started directing. And you know, that's kind of Broadway history. I mean, hit after hit after hit after hit. I can't, I can't name them all, but I don't know, Grand Hotel. Nine. Nine, nine, which is still one of my favorite things I have ever seen at musicals I've ever seen in my life. Just blew me sideways. So he became this major, major director on Broadway. And I always tease him because he's got so many Tony Awards. I said he could make a crown. <laughs> 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 but um, anyway, he, so, but we kept in touch. You know, we'd chat on the phone and send Christmas cards and things. It was pre-emails, obviously. 
in about, it must have been 19, late 1982, he called me and said, I've got our project going. And I said, oh, great. That's great. When do we start filming? And he said, no, it's going to be on Broadway. I said, oh, my God, you must be mad. <laughs> <laughs> I can't I can't do that. And he said, there's no such word as can't. Pack your bags and get out to New York. So I arrived, <laughs> I arrived in New York early 1983. And we went into massive training. And you know, by then I had a little girl, my gorgeous Carly, who I think when we arrived in New York, she would have been four. So I, you know, it was quite a thing, you know, moving the family and getting her into a nursery and, you know, all the things you have to do when you move countries. And we opened in Boston. We had huge troubles with it because we had one director that Tommy didn't get on with, so he left. I was so busy learning my feet that I didn't get involved. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have to say, because Tommy's gone public with it, so it's not telling tales, oh, okay. that he called his friend Mike Nichols, and Mike Nichols came as the cavalry <laughs> to save the show. With the wonderful Peter Stone, bless them both. We're now going to pause momentarily for some news about my audio book, but we'll be right back after these short words. If you like audiobooks, then you will simply love the latest from Julian Schlossberg, entitled Try Not to Hold It Against Me. In his memoir read by the author, Schlossberg tells of negotiating with Al Pacino, Burt Reynolds, and Lillian Hellman, hosting the syndicated radio show Movie Talk, interviewing stars like Jack Nicholson, George Burns, Betty Davis, and Bob Hope, experiencing the paranormal with Shirley MacLaine and Betty Hill, restoring Orson Welles' masterly film Othello, partying with Barbra Streisand and Liza Minnelli, testifying in a lawsuit against the Beatles, whom he loved, and interviewing over 140 major figures for his series, Witnesses to the 20th Century. With a forward by Academy Award winner Elaine May, Try Not to Hold It Against Me gives listeners the behind-the-scenes look at the rarely seen but crucial work of a producer. Schlossberg recounts the trials and triumphs of work and play as a theater, film and TV producer, and radio host. It's a one-of-a-kind autobiography read by one of entertainment's true insiders. Try Not to Hold It Against Me is available on Audible or wherever you get your audiobooks. By then, we were performing the show we'd learnt which wasn't working very well, but it all it had Gershwin music, so we had glorious, glorious songs. The Gershwins, Gershwin songs. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that we knew was good, but the show was not working. But again, I was so concentrated on my feet. I A lot of it kind of went over my head. Tommy dealt with it. Um, but we had to perform. We had bookings in Boston, you know, so we were performing one show. Uh, Mike Nichols and Peter Stone came up to watch it, and Tommy had said to them, you know, I want you to be, because they were all great friends. He said, I want the truth. Have we got a show? Uh, is there anything there? And um, Tommy, I didn't go into the meeting afterwards, but Tommy told me afterwards that they, they loved the music. They loved the two of us and our chemistry, but the script was rubbish and the show wasn't working. So Tommy said, what do we do? And Peter Stone said, I'll rewrite it. So... <laughs> So we were learning one show in the afternoon and playing another <laughs> show. I mean, I thought I could do anything after this. I had things written up my arm and up my arms in biro in case I forgot which bit I was going to do. Oh, it was absolute. But, you know, talk about learning the hard way. I thought I could do anything after that. Anyway, we finally got a show that they were all happy with. Um, we went back to New York after Boston. We then needed, I think it was, oh, I, I don't know how much money, but it, it seemed like a lot of money then, but it probably it isn't now. I think we needed another million dollars to open. That was the scariest day, actually. All the heavies came in from LA because Paramount, yeah, we're out studio. And it was Michael Eisner and Jeff, Katzenberg, Barry Diller, the three of them. And they came in and they with all their people. So they were all in gray suits with their briefcase. And we had to perform the, the first act in a 
big rehearsal room, but they were this close. I mean, you know, it was like, it was scary. That was scary because we knew if they didn't like it, we didn't have a show because they we couldn't open yeah. without the money. Anyway, we did it and we had to wait 24 hours and we got it, obviously. We opened on May 1st, 1983. To rave reviews. <laughs> you know, you sure did. I sat there enthralled because to be able to watch the two of you dancing, not only on the stage, but in water, actually <laughs> dancing in water. Would, I couldn't believe that. Well, Tommy had always had a dream to do a, a dance in water on the stage. Before it, we got it working, I mean, I went arse over, well, I won't say it, rude word, but. I fell on my bum a few times because what would happen? It was a very sh shallow trough, if you remember, that was they dug out of the stage. It was brilliantly designed, and a lid would come off for that number. And they'd lined it with a kind of, well, at first, a smooth rubber lining that they put like an inch of water in because we tap danced in it. So it splashed everywhere. I mean, the front row used to get soaked. <laughs> <laughs> And after a few days, of course, algae had formed. So I jumped in one afternoon. I mean, it, was, it wasn't in front of an audience. We were still testing it and went absolutely flying and landed on my bottom. And I mean, I was lucky I didn't hurt myself, really. So they kept having to, you know, and they had to clean it out. Then they, then they, they finally, I think, found a ribbed rubber so that it wasn't smooth. Anyway, they got it working, and it used to bring the house down every night, of course. <laughs> oh, it was, it was one of the highlights of the show, no question. As we both know, you're talking about probably one of the greatest directors oh, that ever lived. Absolutely. And not only for film, but for theater, too. People don't know, a lot of them don't know he was the original director of Barefoot in the Park and the odd couple. I mean, it he, as you know, he was the loveliest man. I loved Mike so much. And he was so one, he was very gentle with me and very kind. And I don't remember anything specific. Quite honestly, it was such a panic time because I had to forget the old script. I mean, it was a complete rewrite. I was the same name and character, but the... <laughs> story was completely different the only thing that remained the same with the music the, so the song and the dance yeah, right it, and me and tommy that's it most of the car well the girl dancers and boy dancers stayed sadly a lot of the other cast d didn't fit into the new story so it, i mean it, it was it's very hard and you you kind of all become friends well you know what it's like with the show but yes. i have to say it was the best 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 experience of my career i think doing that show because i didn't think i could do it <laughs> yeah well let's talk about this we've got the boyfriend we've got my one and only and now yay if love were all yeah. <laughs> and that's how we met and i'm so happy to say that you could sing and you could dance and you could act oh well, thank you you were just terrific as Gertrude Lawrence, and it was a play about the relationship, friendship, with Noel Coward and Gertrude Lawrence and uh, Harry Groner, the wonderful Harry Groner. Wasn't he amazing playing Coward? It was so funny, as you know, we because Lee, Lee, my husband, Lee Lawson, he directed it. Um, and, had, he did. and he'd got permission from Sheridan Morley, who'd written the original Noel and Gertie, to change it a bit and, and put different Coward songs in. We wanted ones that were more known in America. Yes. Because in Noel and Gertie, some of the obscure ones are there, and we just thought, it, if you're going to do a show on Coward, use his hits. <laughs> yes, uh, but and, and we were looking for an, an English guy to play Noel. And it actually, it was Tony Walton, the lovely, gorgeous Tony Walton, the brilliant set designer who did our sets. And and he, I mean, God, he got an Oscar for all that jazz, didn't he, I think? Yes, yes. yes. He was a genius. And again, one of the loveliest men in the world. We sadly lost him two years ago. He, he said, you've got to see Harry Groner. And, and Lee said, yeah, but he's American. Tony said he can do anything. I promise you, he's brilliant. And 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 Lee kind of kept seeing other English people that weren't right. And in the end, because he was getting so desperate, because by then we had a theatre, we had you know you were all involved. And he saw Harry, and he was wasn't he brilliant? 
He was terrific. He used to amaze me every night. You know, they talk about chemistry, and sometimes I don't know how you define it except to say, you know it when you see it. <laughs> and boy, you two were really, really had it. I've produced 60 shows and plays and movies. I would say, honestly, that's one of the happiest times oh. I ever spent. Oh, well, thank you. We never had ego crap. We just had people working to do the best show we could. It was a good team, wasn't it? Well, you were brilliant. Well, without you, it wouldn't have happened. And do you remember lovely Mark? You should, we should tell that story, Mark, um, Rabbi Mark. Oh, yes, our Rabbi, our Rabbi, <laughs> yes. Well, I had done a radio show in New York for many years, and on the station there was a religious show that this rabbi would do. And I said hello, and he said hello. I never have had ten words to him, and nor he to me. And years go by, and I'm doing the show with Twiggy and Harry Groner. We can change the title from Noel and Gertie to If Love Were All. Not a great title, but better than Noel and Gertie, we felt. <laughs> and it was also a song in the show, and it really meant what their relationship was. But anyhow, I'm down some money, as you guys were on my one and only, and out of the blue, and I mean out of the blue, Rabbi Mark Golub calls me and says, I know that you're producing plays. Can I watch and get involved in it? I said, well, one way you could get involved is to, I'm doing a play now, and you can invest. <laughs> and he said, how much? I told him how much. He said, okay. I almost fell, I fell, <laughs> almost fell off the phone. I'm not used to okay. I'm used to thanks a lot, but goodbye, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and that's how he came aboard. He came aboard that way. It was incredible. That whole experience, which I write about in my book, I know. Is, is, like, is like Mickey and Judy coming together. I mean, Aww. the day before we start rehearsal, one of the so-called rich investors pulls out and I'm having lunch with one of the men who started Creative Artists, the CAA, Bill Haber. Mm -hmm. And I walk in and Bill says, boy, you look unhappy. I said, I am unhappy. He's, why? I said, well, I just lost this investor. He said, how much money do you need? And I told him how much. And he said, I'll give it to you. What? What? You know, I, I mean, at this point, I... Well, they, because they respected you so much and they trusted you. Maybe they had such pity. <laughs> Pity, I think, was the word. <laughs> Anyhow, I got back to my office, and as you know, Twigs, there's a lot of papers when you have an investor. New York State is very tough, and yet papers are thick. They're like war and peace. I mean, it really <laughs> a lot, a lot. I got back to my office, and I started to have the papers put together when a messenger comes in with the check. He didn't even have the papers. Wow. He just sent the check. How amazing. So to Bill Haber, if you're listening. We uh, love big you, thank Bill. You from, <laughs> <that's right. laughs> from Twigs and me. But, you know, in a way, if you look about it, Twigs, I mean, you think to yourself, look what happened here. Remember, we don't want to say whom, but you had a producer. And I became your friend. I just loved you guys. I know. I know. We hit it off immediately, didn't we? And all of a sudden, Lee pushed me into producing. I don't know how he did it. I, I can't believe it. I keep saying, I'll be the godfather. He says, no, no, the father, the father. <laughs> no. Well, it was, me it was meant to be. It was meant to be. It was. and It was an incredibly happy time. It was actually harder for me than uh, my one and only because it was a two-hander. Because in my one and only, we had a chorus, we had other characters. So I, if I had a song, I'd then be off stage, you know, probably for 15, 20 minutes. If, if I was off stage for Harry's solo, I was changing. <laughs> the only time you were off stage was to change your costume is right, you know. That's what I mean, yeah. That's it. So it was, two, it was a wonderful two hours and, you know, performing all the Nut Coward songs and pieces from his plays, which I loved. I love doing that. Now, let's talk about what you're doing now, you old <laughs> podcaster, you. A with Twiggy. Tell, tell us about, A, how that came to pass. Are you enjoying it? And who have you had on? Who have you had on? Because it's worldwide. Anyone can get it. Just typing in T with Twiggy. 
I can't list them all because we've done, God, over 60 now. And I'm going to upset people if I don't mention. Well, you've been on it, as you know. We've got Julia Schlossberg. I'm no longer upset now. <laughs> Quite honestly, I, I didn't really know what a podcast was. They'd only been going here. It, was, it came to me the year COVID hit in 2020. As you know, everything st- stopped <laughs> on your side of the Atlantic and this side. And it was quite scary, wasn't it? I mean, it was like shut down, the world shut down. And we didn't know what was going to happen. And, you know, and for some people it was horrendous because so many people died. We were in our house in the countryside and I got a call from my agent. He said, do you want to do a podcast? And I said, yeah, what's a podcast? <laughs> and he said, well, it's, you know, if you go into your internet and you can look it up. There were quite a few. I think they'd been going in England for about three or four years. And there were like two or three really big ones. A lot of them were kind of political and some were kind of comedians, you know, because they make great podcasters because it's so funny to listen to. And then there were a few celebrity ones uh, interviewing other celebrities. And he said, I just thought it would be something for you to do and it would be fun and you're, you you love to chat, which is true. So I said, yeah, well, that sounds right. He said, because I've got a broadcaster who'd love you to do it. And and Lee came up with the, the title Tea with Twiggy, which we thought was quite, you know, fun. And I decided if, if I'm going to do it, I'm just going to – I want it to be a night nice, like we're doing now, a just nice, a friendly chat. I'm not going to get intrusive. I don't ask personal, personal questions. And what happens, especially with – celebrity people, if they know you're not after some salacious gossip or you're just they they open up and they tell the most wonderful story. I mean I I was so thrilled because I I'd never met him before, but a f- great, great friend of mine, Wendy Asher, who I love to bits, she was in London. She's married to Peter Asher, who I think you know. Oh yes. And she was in London and she called me up and she said, Are you free to come to tea? And I was with Carly actually, my daughter. I said, yeah, well, that'd be nice. She said, because James is coming over. He's got to do his washing. And I said, James who? And she said, (laughs) said, James Taylor. (laughs) I said, why is he coming over to do his washing? He was on tour and he was staying in a hotel and he'd asked if he could come over and use her washing machine. I said, oh, my God, I've never met James Taylor. I'd love to. And Carly was beside herself. We were so excited because we're huge <laughs> fans. Anyway, he he turned out to be the sweetest, loveliest man, as I thought he would be. And Wendy, I, I, I said to Wendy, I'd love him to do my podcast, but I'm too shy to ask. And so Wendy asked, will you do Twiggy's podcast? He said, sure, sure. And, and he told the amazing stories, absolutely amazing. So I've had extraordinary people like yourself, I've tried to have a mixed bag. I've got, I've had writers on. I, um, Ken Follett, do you, are you a Ken Follett fan? Wonderful writer. Yes. And then obviously people like Emma Thompson, Roger Daughtry from The Who, Bill Wyman, I, we did last week. Cause I'm, do, I'm recording with him at the moment. He, he, like me, loves all those period songs and he wanted to do an album. You'd remember, I'm sure, in the, in America, there were a couple called Mary Ford and Les Paul. No, Les Paul and Mary Ford. That's right. That's it. Because the Les Paul guitar, he he was this genius guitar. Oh, yeah. he was one of the great, the great, brilliant. Yes. Every guitar player loves Les Paul. Anyway, Mary Ford had the most beautiful voice as well. And they had massive, massive hits. So Bill said why don't we do a kind of tribute to the Mary Ford Les Paul? So we've done, I think, 12 songs of that period. It's been really fun, actually. But I had him on my podcast last week. I remember one of the huge songs they did was How High the Moon. Somewhere there's music, How High the Moon, yeah. Oh, yeah, we didn't. We haven't done that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there's some gorgeous ones. A Cottage for Sale we did. And, oh, God, I can't even think how many. I mean, they're all lovely songs. Tell me a little bit about something called close-up, which I know what a close-up is, but I think (laughs) this is different. Yeah, it's been quite an exciting, last year was very exciting. What happened about probably six, seven years ago, it's hard to work out because we lost those three years with COVID, didn't we? Everything stopped. So I kind of have to think back. One of our dear, dear friends is a, a brilliant, brilliant writer, performer, comedian called Ben Elton. I don't know whether he's known in America. I don't know. 
He wrote the Queen musical, We Will Rock You, which I think has been in America. Yes, it has. And it's all the Queen songs. That's, I think that's how he's known in America. But in England, he's massive because he's a stand-up comedian. He's a writer. He, he's written TV. Anyway, he's brilliant. And he's really prolific. He's always mm-hmm. doing 10 projects at once. <laughs> and about six or seven years ago, we were having dinner. And when you're kind of known in the world like I am, you, you often get people approaching you to do your story whether it be drama or whatever, TV, film. And that's happened over the years. And I didn't realise, but a few years back, it came to our notice that actually anyone can do your life story without your permission, which is a bit scary. Isn't that terrible? I think that's awful. But anyway, I was getting very nervous that somebody was going to do it without our permission. Before we had dinner with Ben, somebody had sent us a really bad, treatment script it was terrible and we said we've got you know we've got to we've got we've got to do this because somebody's going to do it and if it's rubbish if 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 we do it and it's rubbish it's our fault but if somebody else does it, that's it's our rubbish yeah it's our it's rubbish it's our rubbish so <laughs> we were having dinner with Ben Elton and, and I, we were telling him this story and he said well I should write it I'll do it he said, I know you, I love you, and, and we're friends, and I'll write it. And I, I'm, oh, my goodness, really? And he's also, you know, he's written 15 books, best-selling book. I mean, he never stops. So I said, oh, my goodness. And he said, what do you think? And I said, well, it would be wonderful. Originally, he was kind of preparing a treatment for a three-part TV drama. That was the first kind of idea. And he was working on that, and he works very fast. And about two years ago, I mean, COVID hit, so it all kind of got put on hold, but he was still writing and coming. And I was talking to him on the phone and I'd done an autobiography, Twiggy in Black and White, in the early 90s, and he was working from that. He then had a meeting when kind of COVID ended with the Chocolate Factory in London, which is, I don't know whether you know of it, but it's a very, very prestige. It's our best fringe theatre in London. I do. It's, and it, it, it's in an old chocolate factory. That's why it's called that. And the, the man who runs it is a lovely, the artistic director is a lovely man called David Babani. And he's done many, many shows there that have transferred to Broadway, not only to West End. I mean, he's got one at the moment with Sonia Friedman, Merrily, We Roll Along, that, that's theirs. And I think that started at the Chocolate Factory, I think. Anyway, so he was having a meeting with Baban, David Babani about another idea for a show. And David didn't like it. And he said, are you working on anything else? And he said, well, I am working with Twiggy about her life story and, you know, doing it as a drama. And he said, turn it into a show, I'll do it. Whoa. So, <laughs> Whoa. so Ben rang us and said, what do you think? And I said, oh, my God. Well, yeah. And he said, I think it should be a musical. And so he took his treatment and he turned it. I mean, he's he's so fast. Within nine months, you know, six months, he had a script. I mean, it changed a lot. but And then we opened at the Chocolate Factory in September of 23 it ran for nine weeks because you just do short you know it's a fringe so you do short runs the show before us was um directed by trevor nunn the third they'd done a musical about the third man then it was our show close up which is a pun on close up close you know yes you got it yes i got it (laughs) well (laughs) you got it and close up of my life and then the show after us which is just about to finish is uh, Pacific Overtures. So he does really good stuff, David. But anyway, we open. It was so nervous. I mean, I sat, well, I cried through most of the performances (laughs) because it, you know, it depicts my mum and dad. And It's got to be a very strange experience. It is. But he did such a beautiful job. And our cast, the girl who played me was so wonderful. I loved her so much. She had the most brilliant voice. And what was great, because of the era, I mean, we we cover my childhood and the 60s and up to my one and only. That's kind of where we stopped. But we had the choice of, you know, it's a jukebox musical. So all the songs, it was so much fun picking the songs that would work. And, and we got the rights to most of the ones we wanted. And our cast were amazing. Did she dance as well? 
she wasn't really a dancer, the, the girl who played me at the Chocolate Factory. We had news the other day that it, we've got a tour starting at the end of this year. Well, September. So a tour of England. And then the world. <laughs> and, no, and then the world. The and world. The world. The world. <laughs> we hope. <laughs> I heard rumours, so you can either say it's true or not, <laughs> that there's going to be a documentary about you, yeah, just in case things You'll are quiet. You'll be so sick of me, Julian. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's this all about? Is it going to be based on close-up? Uh, no, no. No, the documentary came along first, funny enough. Oh, and again, oh. that came out of my podcast because Sadie Frost, who's directing it, who's an actress turned director, lovely lady, and I've known her for a long time, she came on my podcast to promote her last documentary, which was about Mary Quant. Oh, yeah. She did a beautiful job. I don't know whether you've seen it. It's really good. It's called Quant. No, but I, I certainly was a fan of her since I was around for the 1960s. <laughs> <laughs> that woman took over fashion and design pretty big in England and then around the world, right? Yeah, absolutely. So she'd done that, and her PR approached us, my production company who do the podcast, and said, could Sadie come on, you know, to promote it? And I said, oh, great. So she came on to talk about Quant and we chatted about many other things. And then I said to her, are you are you going to do any more documentaries? Because, you know, it's brilliant that you've kind of, she hasn't stopped acting, but, you know, she's opened another door into another field, which is great. And she said, well, I love doing the quant one because I loved the sixties and all that. Cause she's that much younger than me. So there's always this aura around the sixties for the people who there, never, there is. who never lived in it, isn't there? They, that's, they're always, right. um, so she said, and I love doing all the research. And she said, I, I, I think I'd like to do another one about somebody in the six. Oh, I should do you. She said, <laughs> <laughs> so she said, what do you think? And I, I said, we'll talk about it when we come off air. So, so anyway, we did and we're doing it. So do you realize though, in talking to you today, how many of these things came um, almost as if somebody up there likes you? I, I mean, I, these are not well-planned out moves. <laughs> these just come <laughs> And you say, okay, I'll, I'll do my first movie. Why not? Have you ever sang? No. Have you ever danced? No. Ever acted? No. I'll be the star, though. <laughs> what? You'll be the star and you've never done these things? I mean, and it just goes on and on, darling. It just does. It's mad, really. I know. All the things that happened to me shouldn't on paper shouldn't have happened. I shouldn't have been a model. <laughs> <laughs> I was the wrong size, wrong shape, wrong age. Everything about it. I mean, it's amazing to me. Really. It is mad. I mean, I believe in kind of something out there that happens. Sometimes journalists ask you, what are you planning to do next? Or how, how did you plan your... I don't think you can plan a career. No. Well, people do. How? Take someone like Madonna. She created everything. She created... Yeah, but brilliantly. And brilliantly. Oh, I'm not putting it down. I'm saying incredible. You can do it, but it's very rare. One thing's for sure, you didn't do it that way. And Sinatra would say, you did it your way. <laughs> I did, I did. Well, I think also because of what happened to me, because it wasn't planned, it was all, everything was a wonderful bonus and a surprise. And I, I, I kind of, I wasn't particularly that ambitious. So, and sometimes that helps, I think, because I know people who are, incredibly driven, ambitious, and they're not very happy. No, they're not. Because if it, if it doesn't work, it destroys them. And as you know, you know us well, you know me and Lee and our family, you know, that for me is my main reason to be because I think being happy with your partner and your children, if you have them, and you're, now I've got grandchildren who I am completely obsessed with. <laughs> <laughs> and that saves you in a way because it's not all about the next job and I didn't get that part and I didn't, you know, I, they wouldn't have me, you know, that eats away at you. It's horrible. Oh, it's terrible. And but look at your life force. I mean, look how young you look. Look how young you act. <laughs> I mean, you're just a special person. I want to read you one quick thing. Go on then. From, you'll forgive me, my book, Try Not oh, to Hold good. It Against Me. And it's, 
my conversation with your husband, Lee Lawson. Go on, then. All I've been trying to do is advise him. That's it. He comes to me and he says, I'd like you to consider producing this. And I, I say, Julian, I don't like the title. Lee says, so we'll change it. <laughs> well, there are some scenes that don't work for me. Lee says, so we'll get them rewritten. <laughs> I say, what if I want them out? I'm sure we can work together on it. I'm not sure I can raise all the money. Well, I'll help you raise some. <laughs> so it's just checkmate. The man <laughs> was absolutely <laughs> determined that I was going to produce it. And I was trying to find a way. Maybe Ouch. I won. And boy, I, I, I'm so glad he did. I'm so glad he did. Well, I'm so glad he did as well. Tell me if you had to look back, and right now even, what would you say was one of the happiest times of your professional life? I know personal. I know the answer to personal. But tell me about professionally. Where would you say you were really happy? Most of the things I've done, I've been happy. They haven't all been hits. I don't think you can do something just because you think it's going to be a success. You should do it because you feel passionately about it. But I was incredibly happy doing The Boyfriend. I was incredibly happy that first trip to New York working with Melvin Sokolsky. I mean, it was, you've got to, you know, I'd lived in Neasdom, which is <laughs> like, I don't know what you've got the equivalent of, but, you know, it's like a funny little suburb in outer London. You know, I mean, it was nice, but, you know, I'd never been anywhere before the whole thing happened to me. And then suddenly I was in Paris and then New York and then Tokyo. I mean, it was mad. But it was brilliant. It was bonkers, absolutely bonkers. And then obviously doing The Boyfriend and My One and Only. And if love were all, I mean, I, I've loved everything I've done, actually. I've been lucky. I wouldn't say lucky. I'd say fortunate. Yes. I would say fortunate. Yeah. yeah. Tell me about your mom and dad. They were certainly alive when you became this phenomenon. How did they handle it? What did they think? It's hard to explain but in in England they understand. But he came from the north of England. I'm I, we're in London in the south, and the north of England. And Northerners are very straight talking and honest. And he was a real feet on the ground. On it, he was. I loved my dad. Yeah, I think I was his favourite actually. My sisters were like seven and fifteen years older than me, so I suddenly came along as the baby. Was he a Yorkshire man? No. Oh, no. He was Lancashire. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I'm yeah. glad he's not around. Yeah, no, I'm glad. No, he, no, He'd he get very know. upset with me. That's all right. Yeah. No, he was He was from Bolton and he was from Lancashire. And But he'd lived in London in since his early 20s. So he was very protective and was very nervous about what – because when that thing broke in the papers saying I was the face of 66, I didn't have an agent or anything. We got calls through the newspaper to our home phone. You know, we didn't have mobiles in those days. And I was being booked to go to Paris and, you know, shoot in London. And I had to get permission to leave school. So dad had to kind of give me permission to do that. And he was lovely because he said, you know, I'm not sure you're making the right decision. You know, you're doing very well at school. You know, I was just 16 and I was just coming up to doing my big exams and he said, you know, you're doing very well. And, you know, this could all be a flash in the pan. It could last for three months, which, you know, it could have done. But he said, if I deny you doing it, you might end up hating me. And I said, well, I'll never end up hating you because I love you. But I thought it was quite wise. What he did do, he said, you're never going to go to a photographer's studio on your own. You'll always have a chaperone. And I didn't know what he meant then. But, you know, now we hear all these terrible stories of young girls. I was really green. You know, we didn't have social media in those days. The only magazines I saw were teenage magazines or fashion magazines. I didn't know about things that could happen between <laughs> people that shouldn't do things to other people. But my dad did. He built film sets. So kind of he was a grown up man and he knew what can go on. So he said, if you're going to do it, Either the guy who was my boyfriend has to go with you or I'll come or mum will come or your elder sister. Let's get the mum. How did she handle all of this? Oh, she loved it. <laughs> <laughs> she loved all the kind of, you know, the she loved it when film crews came over and, you know, were filming me. She loved it. But 
it was very exciting. Things didn't happen to people like me in those days. Yeah, as you said, working class family did not have worldwide attention, to say the least. Oh, wow. Well, I think we've done it by gum. By, <laughs> by law, by God, we've done it. And I can't thank you enough, Twigs. And so, uh, thank you. Marin and I miss you and Lee. You'll never know how much. I know. Well, hopefully. I mean, we were actually, we were at a function last night and I was sitting next to um, an American gentleman who was lovely and it was really making me miss. He was talking about New York. And um, so I said, oh, we've got, we've got to get out there. Well, hopefully, if our tour does well and we hopefully we'll be bringing our show to America. And I'm coming opening night, whether I'm invited or not. <laughs> you can sit on my lap, Julian. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Twigs, I'm going to get permission first from Marin. <laughs> <laughs> Quite right. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on Julian Schlossberg's Movie Talk. Remember to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Produced by Audavita Studios. Connect your voice to the world.